throw your cranes up.
So he, he's, uh, he's a Microsoft technical fellow, and he's one of the best and most influential people in our field. So it's a great pleasure to have him here give a talk, and he's interested in meeting people later. So stick around if you want to give him a talk, uh, ask him a question or something. So, so he's been joining Microsoft, Microsoft since 1993 when he founded the speech and language group there. So he has been very influential in how to make the speech technology available to people through Windows application and PowerPoint application recently. And before that, he was faculty member at Carnegie Mellon, CMU in Pittsburgh. So he has received so many awards and he is a follow for IEEE ACM. So as, as I say, it's very hard to introduce him in a very short you know, uh, moment. So, so please w let's welcome today Sean Dong for his talk today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm very excited to be in Montreal. Sorry, I don't speak French, but I know bonjour, okay? Um, I want to share with you the most exciting things we're doing in speech and language. This is really the crown jewel of AI. And if you really want to actually work on something that will lead to the future, this is it. I'm glad that we have this workshop. We can exchange ideas. We can really invent that something that needs to be invented. So, the Economist had uh, this cover story just uh, you know, two years ago that illustrated the speech and the language in the last 40 years. Started with IBM that uh, you know, had the translation research since 1950. So that the journey, it's just amazing to see what kind of milestones they picked up um, from speech recognition, DARPA funded uh, program to most recently Apple, Google, and Microsoft, what they have been doing in the field. Um, so if you are interested in that brief history, this is actually the table uh, through the journey. So in the last three years, I'm very happy to share, working with many colleagues in the community, Microsoft has been the first to reach it human parity in a number of major public research benchmarks. In, 19, in 2017, on the famous switchboard task, the error rate was reduced to you know, around 5%. This was as good as four professional people working on the same task without time constraint, and they can check notes. In 2018, once again, on the WMT machine translation benchmark, we are able to translate Chinese news to English. On the sentence by sentence basis, that's a big condition, as good as professional certified translation people. If you relax that constraint, humans are still doing better because they have broader context. And this year on the Stanford conversational question and answer benchmark, once again, we are able to answer questions like your participating SAT test as good as any real people. So this is the most recent conversational QA benchmark breakthrough. So those are the research breakthroughs that provided the foundational pieces for services to our customers. Of course, we have, we have been doing this with uh, many colleagues in the community. Um, if you think about the product or services that Microsoft offers on Azure in the cloud, we're not constrained by using you know, fixed research benchmark data or training data. And we have utilized a huge amount of computing resources on the cloud and the data so this is the scale of uh, the kind of data we're using. If you look at the speech recognition, the number of words we're using to train the language model, essentially is the whole web. Because we have the search engine, we index everything in the universe that's public. So it's on the trillions word level. And the number of hours of speech is 10 to the five. 
it's still growing because the amount of speech transcription we can get is far less than this unsupervised text corpus you can get from the web. But that is the basis of actual speech recognition today behind the scene. If you look at the text to speech, on the other hand, right now it's 10 to the two. If in the past, you just have you know, one professional person coming to the lab to record 100 hours of speech has been very expensive. Today, just like speech recognition, you are not developing a speaker dependent system. We're able to really take advantage of transfer learning. We can gather you know, multiple people coming to the lab, record enough high quality and we can create the text-to-speech through multi-style training. That reduces the cost and increases the flexibility. And still, it's 10 to the 2. But as we accumulate more data, we expect the neural text-to-speech will be even better in the years ahead. Today, we do not have benchmark on the neural TTS quality. That's why you know, I didn't actually illustrate the neural TTS breakthrough. As a matter of fact, on my Microsoft Azure Speech Services, we have this neural text-to-speech. It's already in production. That's uh, as good as a real person for most of the people. You may not have you know, the emotional match. Depends on the subject. But uh, just for ordinary sentences, to have Azure speech to speak up, you actually see from my talk later today, it's pretty human-like. Um, for machine translation, traditionally, we have been using parallel corpora. That typically requires two languages uh, in order of 10 to the 9. Once again, like uh, neural TTS, because of transfer learning, were able to even start without any parallel corpora through the unified encoding and unified lexicon representation. We can start with zero parallel corpora. Just have enough monolingual corpora. We can jump start. This is very, very important for the low resource language. As you accumulate enough parallel corpora, we can continuously improve the quality. So our dream is really we can provide this universal translation and the language services for everyone in this planet, for 7,000 languages spoken on this planet. We should not have language barriers to really make this world a better place for, us, for all of us to communicate. So that is the sense of purpose all of us have. That's why we're still working on speech and language after all those years. So big data, once again, is behind the amazing progress that Microsoft made and also all of us made together in delivering high quality speech and language services. So I want to break down to talk a little bit about each category, speech recognition, translation, synthesis, and the conversation QA. What is we did behind the scene? So when you think about the big data, one of the really critical factors is really pick the right data. Even though you might have you know, 200,000 hours of transcribed data and to cover a wide range of topics, depends on the application, you still don't have enough data or the right data. Um, the text-to-speech is also similar. You might have you know, few voices fonts, but that's never the voice you like for your own. Just imagine you have, you know, when you are a kid, to listen to the bedtime story. I'm pretty sure your mom's voice would be preferred, as always, even though you might have a professional actor or actress telling the story. But every child loves 
their mom's voice. So that customization is always critical to, the, to be individualized. Um, so one of the key messages, big data helps to get the basis right, but most importantly, you need to make sure you have the right data to get everything right, individualized for the customer's needs. Um, we have not seen the end of the power of big data. This is a chart of, uh, you know, speech recognition error rate. The lower, the better. The x-axis is the amount of hours we have to train the system. As you can see, this is actually reported by our colleague. Microsoft observed something similar. The more, the better. Nobody has saturated on using more data to build the baseline system. This is on the acoustic model training. For language model training, it's also similar. The most recent uh, GPT-2 really just illustrate the power of not only more data could help, but also the size of the model could help as well. So that's amazing. A trillion word may not be enough when you have the powerful transformer. So behind the scene, we have the power of big data, the power of right data, and the amazing science of deep learning. And we reach the human parity in transcribing conversational speech on the switchboard. You might have asked, hey, what's left for all of us? We have hundreds of students here trying to participate in this workshop. And my answer is absolutely. There are many unsolved problems. And for the switchboard, you have only two people having a conversation on the phone. And it's a close talk. If you want to open that up, you want to have ambient speech recognition. Just the smaller speakers today is able to really handle people talking, issue command, one command at a time, with wake up word. So ambient speech recognition is much harder, but the ambient multi-people conversation in the meeting is unsolved problem. So Microsoft has started looking to this um, a few years ago. So we introduced the first device that combined the microphone array and the camera array. As you can see, in this meeting, all of you guys, I just you look at the left and right, or we'll open the eyes. Nobody actually closed the eyes in the meetings. When you close the eyes, you might be able to still understand, but most likely, you will not see the body language. And what's most important, you might fall into sleep. So to combine eyes and the ears together for enhance the transcription is a new frontier that we have started uh, working on this device paired with Azure Speech. Um, what's actually more exciting, I want to tell you, we could uh, even get rid of the smart speakers by combining your mobile phones and the PCs, and I see a lot of people got the PCs put out. Every PC has a microphone. We can federate the microphone dynamically in the cloud to form a microphone array. That can actually really have amazing impact for the ambient speech recognition for multiple people in a conference room. So the next video is a real-time demonstration of what the we presented in the Microsoft Build Conference. Let me just play the video here. Now, one service I wanted to uh, showcase today is the Azure Speech Service. 
Uh, not only is the speech service getting better and better uh, when it comes to speech recognition, in fact, what you'll see in this demo is even for commodity hardware to replace any complex microarray setup so that your speech recognition is world class. But the most interesting thing is when you combine speech recognition with language models that are specific to your organizational data, you can start picking up all the jargon. So imagine a transcript that gets created that has the ability to understand the local jargon that's specific to your organization, your industry, that, that way making the transcript that much more useful. So let's throw it uh, to our team uh, out on the gallery to show you speech translation and transcription. Getting you. The prototype device connected to a cloud service that provided live transcription and translation. We are proud to announce today that we're making the conversation transcription capability within Azure Speech Services available as a preview release. Come on, let me show you. You might also remember this hardware from last year, which we're also making available as a developer device kit. But today, my colleagues and I are gonna give you a demo of new research that we believe will make meeting transcriptions more easily available to everyone in the future. We are going to show you this demo using just the microphones built into this laptop and these two smartphones we have in front of us. With these, we create a microphone array in the cloud that enables Azure Speech Services to provide accurate in-person meeting transcription, even without a special meeting device. Also, you will notice that I didn't bring my phone. But the service can still recognize my voice and correctly identify me because I've given it permission to use my voice print to transcribe what I say. Now, the second thing we're going to show you is that the language model of Azure Speech Service can be trained on the data in your company's Microsoft 365 tenant so it can learn the unique vocabulary of your industry or company. This is available in private preview. Okay, so basically for the next two minutes, we're going to have a rap battle of sorts, but for all of us geeks here in the room. So Heiko is a principal PM on the speech team, and he's gonna give us an example of some dev speak. And Yusuf is in healthcare marketing, and he's gonna dazzle us with a little bit of healthcare tech jargon. So while they speak, I encourage you to follow along with the transcript on the screen so you can see just how powerful the service is. Heiko, take us away. Azure Speech Services are built with VMs running on Azure hypervisors using Ubuntu-based Docker containers that are orchestrated with the Azure Kubernetes service. Azure Speech Services enable a variety of technical capabilities, including ASR, Neural TTS, Microsoft Translator, and related custom services. You can access these using your favorite programming language, such as Java, JavaScript, Node.js, C++, or C Sharp and others. The bar has been set. Okay, now it's your turn to give us a bit of this healthcare jargon. Microsoft Teams can provide EHR integration through ISV vendors, including Infor Cloverleaf, Redox, and others via the HL7 Fire standard. HL7 Fire is HIPAA, Mars E, and GDPR compliant and is based on modern technology, including HTTPS and RESTful protocols, as well as extensible APIs. The Fire open source community makes their source available on GitHub, and the Microsoft Teams Fire implementation is also aligned with Project Argonaut and follows the US core profiles for all the Fire resources it consumes. Well, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call that a draw. <laughs> So while we're going a bit overboard there, we understand that this is incredibly important so that every company in every industry with their own specific jargon can have accurate transcriptions. We're really excited about where this work will take us and our future ambition is to enable conversation transcriptions for anyone, anywhere, at any time. Thank you. Okay, so that was the live demo in the Build Conference in May this year. And Azure Speech Conversation Transcription is available for public preview. So if you are interested in start using it, you can actually start consuming that as of today. 
Now, <clears throat> um, Azure Conversation Transcription is paired with the device SDK, we call the DDK. So the left is a speech-only DDK. It's typically a microphone array, either seven, four, or two, either linear or circular. But typically for a meeting transcription, you have people you know, from 360 degrees. So it's important to have this circular microphone array. And uh, all the seven microphone array audio signals are sent to the cloud. So the really neural signal processing is performed in Azure in the cloud. That's why when you have cross talking, you have pe two people talking at the same time, we're still able to track and to transcribe two people, not only tracking who said what, but also even for cross talking, we're able to really you know, resolve that. Um, without the camera, that is using voice signature to identify who said what. But the, when you have a large number of people, it's a little bit confusing. So it's only suitable for a small conference room, for a small number of people in the meeting. When you have eight or more people, we recommend the second device. That is the microphone array equipped with 360 camera. So we're using audio and the visual signal together to enhance the speech attribution and the speech recognition. And the last one is really a completely new innovation. You do not have the geometric constraint of a microphone on the device. It's all dynamic. Basically, you know, I can see this room. You have this amazing number of laptops and the if you can just say install this software, we can actually have this cloud-centric informing from all the devices, and then the far field ambient speech recognition can be made easier. That's another product form, it's a research prototype we are pursuing. It's a code name, the Denmark, because the, it's like a Lego. You can put all the Legos together to actually have this uh, join the piece that works much better. So the, those three are really, you know, research prototypes, services that are available through our system integration partner, like the middle one, and the device SDK, that's a standard microphone array devices. That's a public preview. You can just get that today. So this diagram illustrates the architecture flow of what is going on behind the scene. Um, it is applicable to either speech only or audiovisual joint speech recognition in our cloud. So for the speech only, it's the lower part. You have the microphone array. We use seven of them. And you have seven channels performing continuous speech separation, the reverberation, and the speech recognition, sound source localization all together. Then you form the conversation flow of exactly what you saw on the video. When you have the video camera, we have the video processing identify your face. We can actually augment speaker diarization, as you know, together with the voice biometric signature to actually provide enhanced quality. So that is the architecture flow of what we're doing in the cloud performing meeting conversation transcription. This continuous speech separation component is uh, basically a new one like you know, any deep learning, when you have challenging task, you can take multiple ch speech channels together as input and provide <coughs> two separated channels. Here, we are able to track cross-talking up to two people. When you have three people all shouting, we are not able to deal with that. But the, for most of the meeting, it's a business meeting, when you can deal with cross-talking for two people, you actually can meet most of the demands. So after you separate two simultaneous talking channel, we send that to MVDR to perform beamforming on their own. That is actually the neural architecture 
For this ad hoc microphone array project Denmark, because of the ad hoc feature, you do not have a geoma ge geometric constraint. We are actually relying on speech recognition to help us to perform this combined beamforming separation and uh, recognition. So the audio stream alignment to plan the beamforming is similar, but we are actually adding speech recognition and the diarization rhization on top of that through this uh, in a combined fashion when we deal with this ad hoc microphone array. And we have this leave one out geom geometry agnostic beamforming. So the mask-based MVDR beamforming is actually on top of this leave out fashion. So this MVDR approach is identical to the traditional MVDR through the way. But what is unique is we having speech recognition through multiple channel with recognizer through leaving one out in the rover fashion to pick the right good one. So that is actually the architecture behind Project Denmark for ad hoc microphone array. Here's the performance of uh, you know, speech recognition of different uh, configuration. The top one is no beam forming at all, as you expected. You know, the error rate is pretty high. The blue one is using all microphone through the rover combined with recognition. As you can see, the more microphone you have, the more devices you have, in general, the better the performance. And the orange one is this interesting name one out. You want the diversity of the combination. When you actually perform MVDR, you intentionally leave one out, then you rover them again, combine them again. That actually got a slightly improved robustness. This was done on the <coughs> standard NIST RT07. So it's pretty interesting. Of course, this the gap. This blue purple here is the close talking microphone. So when you have ambient speech with far field, even if you can steal everyone's laptop, it's still not as good as the close talking microphone. So this last chart I want to illustrate here is the combined impact of front end and the back end. So you can see beamforming, whatever rate. When you have no beamforming, it's 27. When you have everything combined improved, you can re reduce that error rate down to roughly 22%. Of course, the close talk microphone is the oracle number of 14%. So I hope that from this uh, workshop, all of you guys, I know you have this uh, ad hoc microphone array working session. You can push the, you know, this further to close the gap. So I, love, I look forward to hearing your result this afternoon. I know we have an active working group, working session, dealing with the same problem here. So that is the high level summary of what we're doing in Microsoft, dealing with ambient, far field, multi-people, conversation transcription. We're using a wide range of devices from both standard microphone array, microphone array with computer vision, and the dynamic microphone array of your mobile devices and laptop. Now, I want to, I know we have a working session on translation as well, so I want to talk about what we're doing in translation and Microsoft. So this chart illustrated the Azure translation services quality improvement. Um, the blue one was what you guys experienced if you use Microsoft Translator last month. 
That was the blue quality. So we recently upgraded from the blue to red across all the languages. You can see there's a consistent improvement across all the major languages. Um, it's pretty impressive to see a consistent improvement through this transformer-based neural translation. Um, we used the similar recipe we had in achieving human parity, translating from Chinese to English. So that the recipe is uh, adopted in providing Azure translation quality for those languages. We got a consistent, amazing improvement. So the basic technology is summarized on the left. It's a transformer-based core engine. We used to do learning. You basically translate from you know, one language to another, and you want to translate back to make sure you're constrained. Essentially, you double the amount of data you have in improving the quality. And we have multi-path decoding. And of course, the right data, as I said, is super, super important. And you, if you have the garbage in the data, the quality will suffer. So if you have not used Microsoft Translator, install that today, you will be able to enjoy the blue, from blue to orange or red across all the major languages. So what I want to talk is really, yes, for the major languages, we can get a lot of power data, improving the translation quality. But I really want to talk about is we have 7,000 languages. We do not have a lot of data. What is it can we do? So as you know, the Rosetta Stone story is just inspiring and fascinating. Um, we had this British scientist. He started decoding Rosetta Stone. And eventually, the French had a breakthrough. We are able to decode this ancient Egyptian language. Because of that stone, we can see the ancient Greek. Even though it's a very small amount of data, well, finally, British and French working together had a breakthrough. We're able to really decode this ancient Egyptian language. So that inspiration is absolutely driving a lot of research we have here. Actually, we want to move beyond Rosetta Stone story. Um, with our Microsoft translation latest universal translation core engine, we were trying to create this universal translation system by leveraging all the data we have. Now this, by the way, this French guy and the British guy, they were able to speak, I think, 10 languages. Very similar to Microsoft translation system. If you do not have the skill to speak 10 languages, it's almost impossible to decode, decipher this ancient Egyptian language. So of course, Microsoft translation system, we are able to translate the 60 languages better than the French guy and the British. By the way, this British guy is amazing. He was a doctor, graduated from University of Edinburgh, did all those fancy de decoding work, published a lot of stuff. But he always used the uh, anonymous name to fear that his medical career can be jeopardized because he was doing something totally irrelevant to what he was doing. His last name is Young. You can, you can, you can check. Not a Steve Young, Thomas Young. And, and he had a medical training from University of Edinburgh. I proudly alum from myself as well. So with 60 languages, I want to know, we want to know can we leverage those languages, all the encoding, decoding skills you accumulated? Um, here's the, the architecture we have that was published last year. We basically, we want to have this universal lexicon representation, leveraging all the languages we have accumulated so the, the study, what we had was, we had uh, English as the, the common anchor 
We have Spanish, French, and uh, Italian. We have reasonable amount of data. Now we're tested on Romanian and the Korean. You know, why is similar to the European languages we have? The other is really, you know, kind of different. So we created this system that will map Romania into the internal representation through this uh, embedding. Because, you know, for the translation system, you basically map to the encoding, then you decode. You also have the sentence structure you can share from the decoding. So through this joint mapping, it's actually just amazing to see we can really improve the quality. So if you use only about 6,000 sentences, look at the blue line. This is just, you know, you are using standard recipe to train your translation system for Romanian. And you need roughly 600,000 to get to something that's decent. So the multilingual neural translation is the orange one. By leveraging what we have in Spanish, English, Italian, English, French, English, we're able to really help the low resource language. What's actually cool about the green one is with a universal token, the embedding improvement in the paper we summarize, we can actually get amazing result, even without parallel corpora. So this is more powerful than Rosetta Stone story. Rosetta Stone, at least you got this ancient Egyptian language and uh, Greek is a small amount of data to jumpstart. With this universal encoding and the universal lexicon representation mapping, of course, with our language pair, you can get to the point of roughly 15 blue score. With additional parallel corpora, you can continuously improve. And uh, that is the dream we have through the transfer learning. This is actually, I think, a very, we're gonna have a very profound impact to the society. We can leverage um, this uh, reasonably accumulated parallel corpora by leveraging that for low resource language. We hope we can rapidly improve the coverage of our translation system. So there are some typical tricks that you have to apply, like uh, you, know, you need to fine tune on the bird enabled model. And through fine tuning, you can further improve. Here's the, the result of uh, our multilingual neural translation system in the real world scenario. Um, you can see that without the multilingual transfer the learning, you got the essentially the blue for all those no resource languages. Through the leverage of transfer learning, we got massive improvement. And this is for the Indian languages we are covering. You can say they are kind of similar. Yes, in this planet, there are actually a few bigger languages we can cover. We would have the paracorpora, but they are, you know, other languages that are different, but they are similar. We can leverage the transfer learning. So I want to actually add the comment for the Romanian, we got a massive improvement. If we just add the Korean, which is very different, we also got the improvement, but the absolute quality is still not as good. So if you are transfer learning, start with the language that are similar to the language you want to expand, your quality for sure is gonna be much better. But regardless, transfer learning still helps, even for a language that you have never seen and even for a language that's very different. Last but not least, I want to talk about the, this year's um, WMT benchmark. Microsoft Translation got the, you know, amazing coverage and the quality, top quality for multiple language pairs. And there are some 
exciting new on, underlying technology we develop. Why is this multi-agent do learning? You basically want to have multi-agent to essentially to learn the constraint from different agents, not just you know one agent when you do the due learning. And just inspired by BERT, we have this uh, mask sequence to sequence learning that's actually more suitable to the sequential performance. This was also published. And the last is the document level translation. Without it doing much, if you can just you know, expand your translation context, instead of have this sentence-based translation, you e expand to the whole document. And we, we have seen the amazing improvement of the quality. This is just, you know, once again, the data and the context really helped the whole system. So for the multi-agent uh, approach is very similar to the due learning we have introduced in the human parity system. But uh, this one, we just have, you know, different agent. We combine all of them together with the same constraint. That gives us a very decent improvement. On the sequence to sequence pre-training, you have a staged approach, like a deliberation, we can actually make an improvement. Here is the bird-inspired mask that actually beyond, expands beyond the, the bird. It's using sequence to sequence um, to improve the overall quality. So here's the result on the WMT 19 between English and French. Oh, no, English and German, I'm sorry. You can see the improvement of, uh, you know, from the baseline, which is blue to orange. That has back translation. The, the gray one is the one with MADL. Okay? So that is the overall summary of translation. We are improving on the line science. We are selecting data carefully. The, I'm most in, interested in exploring the transfer learning to cover all the languages. That's amazing to see the capability of transfer learning. So I'm pretty sure we can move beyond Rosetta Stone impact. So the for the next one, I want to briefly talk about the conversation QA human parity milestone. Um, <coughs> This was actually most viewed on BERT. Um, so for conversation QA, you have the input, you have the you know, question and answer through BERT and the fine tuning. You are able to get the right answer from the paragraph. So we added additional data in addition to the squad and the cohort data, we added the uh, news QA, multi-NLI, and uh, we also had the, you know, very similar to deliberation network in translation. We have this multi-stage uh, fine-tuning, <coughs> not really fine-tuned and improved the, the quality. And the last but not least, we added the auxiliary language model. That just you know, pushed the overall quality to the level of human's level, another important task. Once again, this is uh, the task of the conversation QA for Stanford Challenge. Um, we love to see if we can expand this to generic conversational application. So for text to speech, I didn't include that in the human parity milestone on the public benchmark. How much time do I have? 10 minutes? All right, I will accelerate. <coughs> so text-to-speech went through something very similar to translation, speech recognition. On the traditional text-to-speech, you have some very customized, complicated system of so many different modules, because you have to deal with language, acoustics, and the prosodic information. On the left, the purple one is the new neural TTS infrastructure that really simplified the whole system 
through the end-to-end -end learning. Once again, like speech recognition, we are able to pull different people's voice together through transfer learning, similar to the translation achievement we talked about. Through this um, speaker encode, encoder and the embedding module, we are able to really observe substantial improvement, not only because you know, we, uh, we are actually we are more flexible because in the past, it's always expensive to get one person coming back to the lab through a long period of time because the professional person cannot record for over one hour, you know, because the person needs a rest. And through the time to gather, you know, a huge amount of data, the voice also changes because the person is getting older. So the quality control is always challenging in all the system. It's very fragile. Now, through the transfer learning, we're able to really, you know, reduce the cost of uh, recording and improving quality. But the most important way we're able to introduce the attribute to change the style, change the, you know, language even. And given the time constraint, I will just skip those, jump directly into my voice. And we can customize my voice. Now you heard my voice. Let me actually play a few voices. I do not speak German. I do not speak Japanese. Let's see. Um, I only speak, uh, you know, even for Chinese, I do not speak Chinese with Sichuan dialect. So the deep learning is able to really manipulate my voice with different attributes and uh, with amazing impact. The triumph of the grail is also the triumph of the sun. So that was not what I said. It's dangerous, but it's what computer synthesize. Because you heard enough of my voice, that sounds like me, right? So if you speak Chinese, you know this guy actually speaking with Sichuan dialect. But I'm, I, I'm not from Sichuan, by the way. And they just manipulated it, had me translate my voice translated and the speaking with a different dialect. Mit dem Angeklagten habe ich auch kaum gesprochen. You speak German? So that's actually my voice speaking German. And the Japanese. I'm able to speak 60 languages freely with my dialect and style. <laughs> this is the power of transfer learning and neural TTS. And to close on this one, I want to share with you the latest event Microsoft just had. We had this uh, amazing HoloLens that can capture your digital hologram and uh, have your voice synthesized, speaking a different language. So Julia White, she is uh, our marketing leader in the company at that conference. She was able to present in Japanese. She's not, I, I can tell you, she doesn't speak Japanese. She is American. And that's actually see the video. Also, this. Let's get started. First, let me introduce you to Mini Me. There she is, my perfect holograph. And thanks to the power of HoloLens 2, she just floats right with me. I'm literally holding my hologram. So natural. Now she's a little small to do a keynote. So let's get her up so she can do full size Japanese keynote. Render keynote. So this is the view from ホログラムこれはニューラルテキスト読み上げと呼ばれる最新の人工知能技術いわゆるニューラルTTSを使用しています私たちは自分の声の録音を使用し私の呼吸聞こえる私自身の個人的な音声署名を作成します
日本語からフランス語ポルトガル語まで話せます今この技術は私たちが働き遊び生活する方法に関して世界中の国境や障壁を取り除くことができると想像してみてくださいまさに SF が現実になるところです So this is um, the public yesterday, so you can actually watch that yourself if you need it. Let's get started. Um, so to end this, I want to really highlight all of us made this amazing progress in the last 30 years, especially on the speech recognition, neural text-to-speech, translation, and I'm most mostly passionate about translation because it is somewhere between perceptive intelligence and the cognitive intelligence. You can say speech recognition, computer vision, neural TTS, they're all at the perceptive level, right? And there's no understanding, there's no reasoning, there's no knowledge acquisition. But still, this is just amazing to see we're approaching humans' capability. Translation is somewhere in between. We pretend we understand, we translate. And still we're doing a reasonable good job. And, but the real challenge for AI is on the cognitive intelligence. The ability to acquire knowledge, ability to reason, to understand, comprehend, is going to be the ultimate challenge for all of us. And uh, I want to quote from Judy, he is the Turing Award recipient, a professor at UCLA. He had this amazing book, The Book of Why. I, I made a copy of what he had in the book. You can see there are three levels of a social, you know, intelligence. And the first level is all about association. That is where the you know, personal assistant or you know, robot are. Right? And the second level is intervention. And the highest level of intelligence is imagination, counterfactual. So all the neural nets, you have a bunch of weights. You train the weight, mostly on the association level. So that's where we are to conquer this amazing challenge to fulfill the, the dream we have. Despite of that challenge, but I'm very optimistic, we are having 7,000, roughly 7,000 to 8,000 languages spoken on this planet. If you look at the GDP, where Microsoft, we're able to translate among 60 languages. That's 95% 90, of the world's GDP. But if you look at you know, the diversity of the language on this planet, simply stunning. Through transfer learning, deep learning, data acquisition, the dream is really, let's actually get rid of the language barrier to make this planet a much better place. When you have no language barriers, we'll be able to understand each other better. We'll be able to remove differences better. We'll remove bias. So this is the sense of purpose all of us have. You're absolutely in the right field working on speech and language. That's my end of the talk. Thank you. All right, thank you, XD, for this wonderful talk and inspiration. So, do you have any questions? I think Lane, I was, you know. Can you, st can you start the microphone there? Uh, put it up. Yes, Testing. I can hear you. Okay, yeah. uh, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Um, I'm working in one of those, in the speech, uh, language processing, in one of those 7,000 very, very low resource languages. Could you go back to the, the, the slide where you were talking about the, the multilingual adaptation? You, in that slide, you talked about needing only seven, six or 7,000 parallel sentences in a new language to, ad to adapt. What amount of training data did you have in the other languages in order to, to get, that kind of, get those kind of numbers? And the other languages we have, it varies from one million to 10 million. Okay. Yeah, because for the, all the tier one languages, we have accumulated enough data. When you have 100,000, probably you'll have good, decent quality. So, so it so varies. 
for English to Chinese, English to German. Those are the two best quality we have in Microsoft translation services. We use roughly 10 million. Okay, so the seven, so the numbers you showed on that chart were six or seven thousand for that for the low resource pair, but very high high numbers for the other other systems that other languages that that was trained on. So even for Romanian, when you have like a twenty thousand parallel sentences, that's the golden standard. So multilingual universal translation is still worse than the language you are trained with uh, more data. So we are, we are not reaching, we are, I'm not claiming by using universal translation, we can actually outperform the language pair that got enough data. But the, the, the challenge is that for 7,000 languages we have, we may not have enough, like 100,000 parallel sentences. So to jump start, to actually provide that basic function, then gradually adapt, learn, improve is our dream, is our strategy. So create that universal translation system, even without any parallel corpora, you can have roughly 15 <coughs> blue points. You can start using it. You can you know, remove language barriers, start from there. As we accumulate enough data, we can gradually close the gap. That's why we can actually, we, I, I hope we can team up with everyone in the community. Let's work together to remove language barriers, to cover 8,000 languages spoken. So we have not solved the problem. The real dream is really through universal language translation. We could actually be as good as a language pair that is, you know, with uh, 10 million sentences. No, that's not the case. Even with 100,000 sentences, you are trained between English and Romanian with 100,000 will be still better today. Thank you. Okay. Well, you can go there. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. And uh, I'm just uh, having a question in regards to the first part. When you do the speech transcription uh, in the demo, it seems like there is no punctuation when the text is generated. And also, it seems to me it's like multiple words are like spits out uh, rather than one word by another. Uh, I wonder if it, there is some reason like uh, why the setting is like this. Um, there's no reason. That is just the limitation of our technology. Right? Okay. So we want to add the punctuation, uh, but we have to make a guess that requires both prosodic and the semantic implication. Right. Because people are not really, when they are in the meeting, they're not talking about the um, you know, the, with speech adding a punctuation. We have to see the semantic meaning of the sentence and the prosodic information, how long is the silence, then add that punctuation automatically. That's okay. the current okay. approach we're taking. Okay, okay, thank you. And the general comment, I'm very impressed by the hologram. It feels to me like the new, newest uh, like uh, episode in Black Mirror. And I feel like uh, this can, <laughs> <laughs> well, if you have watched it. So this can get in like, I feel like uh, probably in the future, maybe you don't have to be physically here, just send your hologram and speak English here where we have like Japanese equivalent version. So yeah, I yes. just don't want to if say If everyone wears a Microsoft HoloLens too, <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> and All right, thank you. Thank you. So before I end here, since uh, we are more relaxed, I want to just actually tell you I'm in Montreal. I respect the tradition. I'm sorry I don't speak uh, French. But uh, PowerPoint actually already had English to French built in. If you have the latest PowerPoint, you can see always use subtitle. Um, you can say it's French. Actually, this can translate into one of the 60 languages. I picked French because I'm here, right? And if when I <coughs> present, I should be able to speak French as it. I don't know. I have no idea what I'm saying. <laughs> but uh, you know, my subtitle is in French. I hope it's in French. So. This is really in production of the latest Microsoft PowerPoint. 
If you give a talk in Turkey, you can speak in French, and uh, the subtitle will, will be in Turkish, or Greek, or Mongolian. <laughs> so feel free to use it. This is a sense of purpose, as I said, to help everyone on this planet. The only bad news is we only support 70 languages. We need to multiply that by another factor of 100. Thank you. All right, we still have some time for more questions or aspirations. You know. Well, I'm just wondering, um, there's a lot of effort nowadays, especially in companies like Facebook, that they are trying to fight against the deep, uh, deep fake. Um, since you have like these beautiful synthesizers, are you also working on that area on uh, how to avoid? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a wonderful question. Um, Microsoft is taking AI very seriously. We have an uh, ethic society committee examining everything we're doing. For example, we have this uh, customization capability of our neural TTS. We, we ship the customization TTS using older technology. It's not as good as neural TTS. But for neural TTS customization, neural voice customization, you can you know, really get the 30, out, 30 minutes of a person's voice, upload to Azure, then, my God, you can speak. You can force a person to speak anything you like. So there's a huge amount of ethical implication we are introducing the code of conduct on how we should actually enable customers using that technology. So this is a work in progress. We are aware of all the challenges you talk about. Yes. How is the humanity going to suffer from our technology? Because we created the fake audio? Well, I think you can look at this from productivity point of view. What if your child can actually enjoy mama's bedtime story. <coughs> That's the positive side. I think you can raise the you know, family more effectively by saving time. And, uh, or you have an anchor person. The anchor person is sick. You get, need to get someone else. The BBC radio could have you know, continued. Even the person is sick. So it depends on how you want to regulate introducing code of conduct. We want to have a responsible approach. So that is actually a work in progress. We are not rushing to get those tools out. I know Montreal has a startup doing the same thing, right? And uh, using neural TTS to customize for different voices. So we are, we are going to face the same code of conduct challenge in dealing with synthesized media. Actually, this is a, you know, a broader problem, how you deal with synthetic media responsibly. Anything else? Yes. OK. Hi, thank you for the conference. I want to know uh, if we want to start uh, working in the translation field, uh, what kind of study or what, what should we do to start in that field? OK, um, translation, like speech recognition, textual speech, they're all similar. And you just have, have this amazing skill. You have to be good at the math. Neural, neural nets is nothing more than just, you know, linear algebra operation, right? Differentiation. Nothing special. So be extremely good at the math and extremely good at the programming because you need to run thousands of experiments. Most of them will not get anywhere. 95% of them will fail. And you have to have endurance. We need to get your hands dirty. We need to really suffer from the failure. So you, those are the three skills Microsoft is looking at. If you are good at math, you are good at programming, you are willing to work hard and to tolerate the failure, you are good hire. 
in general. Because everything is going to be new. What I learned in graduate school, if I look at you know, what is being used today, 30 years from now, 30 years from what I, I was doing, you know, most of them are gone. But the math, programming, the attitude, I think uh, they are more or less the same. So we are hiring. Next year, we're going to actually add 50 people to the speech and language group. So this is great news to the students working in speech and language. So apply to Microsoft. That's actually, you know, join the force to remove language barriers for this planet. I have one more question. And actually, it's not for me. I'm asking for a friend. Okay. <laughs> As always. <laughs> So all these achievements you are showing, they depend on immense amount of computational power, right? So what, what would you say to, let's say, a junior scientist that is starting to work and in field of, let's say, machine translation on ASR or, let's say, machine learning in general and doesn't have 600,000 GPUs available for his experiments? Well, I think uh, you can always constrain your research like a you know, zero-shot adaptation. You can take a Microsoft open source. Microsoft, by the way, just open source the BERT capability on Azure. So you don't need to retrain the whole thing. We not only open source BERT, like the Google, but we also open source the data. So you have the same data we used to train BERT. That wasn't available before. So Azure offers an amazing amount of GPU. I think universities, they got the, you know, uh, some discount. I know that the Stanford the AI class, all the students are using Azure because of the Stanford and the Microsoft agreement. So I don't know for other schools what is the situation, but clearly they are, you can frame the research challenge to build on the success of industrial offering. Like we packaged all the APIs on the cloud. We offered the customization for translation, speech recognition, and the text-to-speech. So the, the, the questions I'm back to professors is, what is you can do? Build the success of your research on Azure speech, Azure translation, and focus on problems we all face together. We need to continuously improve quality Microphone array is still a challenge. You can see the gap between close talk microphone and uh, Project Denmark. Even with all the fancy cloud-based being forming, <laughs> with the recognition, with the computer vision combined, there's still 30% of the gap, right? Um, when you have no data, when you have a small amount of data, like uh, only 6,000 Romanian languages, paracorpora, you are still not as good as you, if you have 100,000 parallel sentences. So the challenge remains. It's actually fantastic to be in the field of speech and the language. Not to mention you, add, you want to add a conversation, understanding, reasoning on top of that. That's just going to be you know, unlimited problems we have to deal with. So I guarantee for the next 30 years, you have a job. Uh, thank you. Uh, when I have a question. When you do transfer learning, uh, if the target uh, data set uh, has a few labels or even no labels, how, how can you uh, in improve their ac accuracy? Yeah. So when you have no paracorpora, you essentially you only map your language into the embedding of common tokens and you leverage the rest of the system. So you can get roughly you know, 10 to 15 points of blue. What to vec embedding is unsupervised. That's the first step, right? And you can also compute the embedding based on the similarity. We have the mixture language you know, experts to actually help you to identify the closest one. When you have the, you know, constraint of the 
monolingual corpora. You still have the constraint of the language structure. That stru structure can be associated with whatever tokens we have, I mean, in the current embedding system, and then leverage the existing universal translation system to translate it into English and other languages. It's not the perfect one, it's a, a starting point. And the small amount of paracorporate, they will actually play a very essential role, like a Rosetta Stone. So you can actually take a look at that paper of uh, our multilingual universal translation. Hello. Um, Hi. Yep, technology is working good. Uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm coming back to the point of you can do this translation capability in 60 languages and you want to go to 6,000 languages, right? So it took us 50 to 60 years to get here. Um, given that some of the 6,000 languages, there is only one speaker left. So I'm kind of curious, wh what are your thoughts on how long is it going to take us to get to the point that we can cover the 6,000 and what do you see as the main hurdles? Yeah, that's a fascinating question. I, I think the answer depends on the quality. Yeah. Right? I, if uh, you can tolerate with 15 blue points, you can accumulate enough monolingual corpora and uh, build the system into the universal translation framework. Start, and uh, yeah. that also depends on whether your language is similar to one of the existing languages we have. Yeah. I would say monolingual is the starting point to jumpstart everything we have. Mm -hmm. You still need a small amount of parallel corpora. I believe to have the ability to translate, have Rosetta Stone kind of inspiration is important. Yes. Get the, you know, 6,000 parallel sentences, and uh, that's a jump start. Mm -hmm. That amount of resources can be achieved by all of us working together. Yeah. So we need a community-like uh, approach, open source sharing everything, and uh, because by removing language barriers, we can make this world a much better place. It's not for the benefit of one country, one nation, it's really for all of us. Uh, yeah, I completely agree. Uh, personally, I have the feeling it might be something like uh, the 1990 challenge. We've done 90% yes. of the work yeah. and because of the scarcity of the, the other languages and they're very different and they're polysynthetic and God knows what else. It will be an interesting challenge for the next, well, several decades. Yeah, um, I hope it's not a several decades. Um, really, just, you know, if you look at the, how long it, t it takes for new technology to get adopted, it's getting shorter and shorter. True. So moving forward, I, I really am optimistic. It will not take 30 years to cover 7,000 languages. Sounds good, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Hi. Um, is emotional state one of the attributes used to improve speech recognition? I, I'm sorry? Um, is emotional state or just, I guess, a little bit of affective computing. Emotional states, I don't think so. Uh, I, I don't think we're using that emotional states um, explicitly in recognition. That might have been reflected in the huge amount of data we have, but we do not model that intentionally. And, okay. That's interesting, yeah. yeah. Just, there are so many dimensions of, uh, you know, people, right? You have accent, you have emotional reaction, you're angry, and uh, just the implication of that is uh, multidimensional. Yes. And um, I, I, that's a good question, I do not know. But yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting, because I, I, I yes. think it would really help absolutely, absolutely. In increase uh, the, the yeah. uh, accuracy. Yeah. Um, but it may come with a lot of responsibilities as well, of course. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The second question, what's the um, largest array of microphones that in continuous uh, that you've used? Or what is the largest? Largest amount of, in, in uh, the arrays of microphone that you could use. Um, we have only, I do not know because uh, yeah, I think uh, Jim Flanagan in the old days had this massive array on the wall, right? I, I do not remember the exact number of microphones. Some of you guys might, but the, today most of the people use the seven to eight. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. I want to also, you know, point out seven to eight microphone depends on the distances. 
and uh, could be actually as good as close talk microphone. In our challenges, we have multiple people talking. They are in ambient environment, very noisy and challenging. So mm -hmm. roughly there's still a 40% gap between close talk microphone and the seven microphone array. When you are distances, you know, ranging from four to 10 meters, that's fairly challenging. So that 40% gap is a research challenge. I hope after this workshop, we'll see you know, a new direction. That's the eye vector moment I was just asking. Do we have an eye vector moment from the workshop? And uh, just one final question. Um, so there's in your news translation slide, there was this, an improvement from 2018 to 2019 for almost all the countries between one to 9%, but Korea jumped about 22%. Was it uh, suddenly more data or was yes, it? Uh, mostly more data. Someone, yeah. yeah? Data, the power of data is just amazing. With, as I said, with all the you know, research on transfer learning, nothing beats um, a sufficient amount of data. Right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Great Thank presentation. You. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to ask a follow-up question on the low resource languages because uh, you, you mentioned in the, uh, your last answer that you're relying a lot on monolingual corpora. Uh, but there are a lot of languages for which we may not have very much parallel corpora, so maybe we have, say, 6,000 sentence pairs, uh, but we also don't have a lot of monolingual corpora. Uh, or that monolingual corpora may be something uh, like a dictionary or a word list or something like that, uh, rather than the kinds of monolingual corpora uh, that you might be able to mine from Wikipedia or something like that. Um, do you have any insight about uh, the amount of monolingual corpora that you need to have to make the methods you've been discussing uh, successful and any sort of additional thoughts about that um, for languages that don't necessarily have the distribution of data sets that you might be expecting? Yeah. Um, I think for translation, this is text-based translation. If you have 10,000 parallel sentences, your quality will be reasonably decent. It's probably better usable. And the more, the better. So 10,000 is probably the minimal. For speech recognition, we require more to have the robustness across you know, different conditions. For a good, decent quality, we need a transcription roughly um, 10,000 hours of speech. So that is the, the ballpark. That is a, the very minimal starting point. For you know, the more the better. If you have you know, 50,000 hours, clearly it's better than 10,000 hours, right? The more the better. So when you have 10 million, that's what we're using for high quality translation. Um, so 10 million to 10,000, that's a huge gap, but 10,000 is probably a starting point for low resource language. Um, and so that also includes the, the monolingual corpora that you're using. So for like the Romanian example where you're talking about uh, getting reasonable quality scores with 6,000 lines of parallel text, um, how much monolingual text are you using? We use all the data from Spanish to English, Spanish, uh, Italian to English and uh, French. But the, those varies, you know, from 100,000 to a million. And uh, also, we added Russian. Russian and Romanian, they belong to the same language family. So once again, in that experiment, I want to just emphasize Korean was in a range of six blue points because they are so different from the auxiliary language in the system. We added Korean just to see the universal multilingual translation is their help from no resource Korean to English translation. But uh, you know, it was like from four points to seven points. But it's still in, moving in the right direction. But it wasn't as good as Romanian that reached like uh, you know, 15 points quickly. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, can we use synthetic generated uh, text to train uh, machine translation models or? Uh, absolutely, yeah. This is, uh, you know, once again, if you have a good, reasonable 
quality translation system you can. So to jump start, that is the challenge for the resource language. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So, all right, let's thank XD for his wonderful time and his patience to answer all this question. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here.